Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Kajabi Edge podcast, where we talk to real entrepreneurs to give you the online business edge you need to succeed on Kajabi. I'm your host, Jared Lohman, Vice President of Customer Experience, and today we're joined by Avery Smith, founder of Data Career Jumpstart. How's it going today, Avery? It's great. Thank you so much for having me, Jared. I'm stoked to be here. Uh, well, definitely excited to have you. Uh, this is kind of, uh, even though it's not a holiday episode, you, uh, we were talking beforehand that you've already went out for a, you know, a ski trip. You've got the Christmas tree in the background. So it feels very like in the spirit of the holidays. For sure. Just the season. I'm excited. I love it. Well, let's just get the ball rolling. Give us just a 15 second elevator pitch of who you are and what you do. Yeah. Okay. My name is Avery Smith. I run a program called Data Career Jumpstart, where basically I just help people pivot into tech. Now, specifically, I help people go from jobs that they hate to landing a data analysis job. So either becoming a data analyst or a data scientist. Exciting. So uh, how did you, how did you get into that field? Were you a data analyst yourself, uh, firsthand or give us a little bit more of like your background? Yeah, for sure. Um, when I went to college, I was probably like a lot of people and I was like, Oh, I have no idea what I want to study, but I was, I was like, Oh, I kind of like math. I kind of like chemistry. Maybe I'll combine the two and I'll study, uh, chemical engineering. And I quickly found out that chemical engineering was not for me. I did not like it at all. And I kind of had this panic of like, Oh, I have to figure out something different to do and kind of a long story, but I basically, you know, stumbled into data analytics at the job I was working at and I absolutely fell in love. And I was like, this is, this is awesome. I have to figure out how to make it, you know, my full time job and go from a chemical engineer to a data analyst. I was able to do that and, you know, kind of work as a data analyst and data scientist in my career. I worked for ExxonMobil. And then uh, I decided that I wanted to, to, you know, pursue being an entrepreneur and uh, kind of landed in the, in the core space eventually. And I was like, Oh, I can help other people, you know, who are like me, who didn't like their job, didn't like what they studied in school and, and do something new. I love it. I love it. And let's, let's just drill right in onto that. Uh, you know, we usually talk about kind of your genesis as it relates to the course business. Um, I'd love to understand, like, just from inception, where did this idea even pop into your mind? Um, and like, what, what, what laid the foundation for you starting off to actually teach others about getting a job in the space? I think it started while I was at ExxonMobil. As part of my role at ExxonMobil, I was like in charge of this um, learning network, uh, this analytics n- learning network, because they could just see how passionate I was for it and how much I loved it. And so I started teaching people actually at my job, you know, other engineers, you know, other business people within the company of ExxonMobil and, you know, helping them become citizen data analysts and being able to be more data literate and, and use data in their decision making. So it, it kind of started there where I was, you know, teaching people at the company. Um, and then I decided, you know, I want to, I want to, not work for the man anymore. I don't want to work the the nine to five corporate life. Uh, I want to try to be an entrepreneur. And so I, I quit my job and I was doing freelancing. Um, and as part of that freelancing, I was, I was mostly doing like contract and like, uh, uh, consulting work. Um, but someone actually asked me to build a course for them. I actually ran a, a little workshop, uh, with probably like 20 people in it. That was my first course that I ever made. Um, and then someone asked me to build a course for their, their program. I built that course out and I thought that was really fun. And I had, you know, run the little workshop before and I had taught people at ExxonMobil. And I was also, I'd also got a master's in data science. And I was like, I didn't really like my master's. I thought it could have been a lot better than it was. And then I kind of realized, well, what if I just create an Avery data master's? Like, what would that look like? What would be, if I could create my master's and go back and redo it, what would I learn? What would I not learn? How would I want it to be structured? And that's kind of what gave birth to my company, Data Career Jumpstart. It was trying to make an Avery data master's basically. (laughs) <laughs> Very nice. Well, there's two things there that I think it would be worth just zoning in on a little bit. One, you quit the job. Um, like that alone is like gotta, I guess, raise some anxiety. Like, can you tell us a little bit more about that process? That was a crazy process. And I, I'll first and say that like I'm very lucky. Um, my wife is very supportive and she really wanted me to, to do it, to, to follow my dream. She knew how much it like meant to me. Um, so it's like she almost pushed me into it more than I pushed myself. So I always have to give her some credit. There's always people in our lives that can see probably bigger potential in ourselves than, than we can. Um, but I, ever since I, you know, was, was young, I wanted to be an entrepreneur and I wanted to run businesses. And in college, I had tried. In college, I had tried to run a couple different businesses and they didn't go very well. I think I maybe made like maybe $300 from being an entrepreneur in college. 
with three really failed businesses, like just terrible business ideas. Um, but, and I'm also very risk adverse. So the idea of leaving, you know, what was a very high paying job, to be honest, like being, being a data scientist at Exxon was a very cush job. I never worked over 40 hours in my life. I was, I was making good money. Um, but I just, something inside of me was like, I want to do something more. I want to have more free time at Exxon. I only had, uh, 10, uh, PTO days. So, you know, paid time off only 10 days. And my wife and I love to travel. We love to, to, you know, visit. We were at the time we we're living in Texas. We like to visit family back at home. It was just not really catering to our lifestyle. So I was really, really, you know, excited to, to quit, but it was so scary. I was terrified out of my mind, um, to do it, but I actually, um, read in this book. It's how I built this by Guy Ross, also a, a great podcast. Um, and he, he just this idea to me is, is it scary or is it dangerous? And it's kind of like as humans, we're scared of sharks. But really, sharks are not nearly as dangerous as driving in our car. And we're not scared of that at all. And so it made me realize, you know, leaving my job was scary, but staying at my job was probably dangerous. Doing something I didn't love for a long time, I think that's a dangerous way to live. And so that kind of helped me take the, the jump in. It's been good so far. I don't regret it. Very cool. Well, the other thing that stood out to me is you mentioned someone had asked you to create a course. Uh, can you like, I guess just give us a little bit of a, a view of the timeline. You, you quit your job. You started freelancing. Where did, where did that come into the process? Was it a client of yours? Yeah. So in when, so when I graduated college, I was, I was working as a data analyst for this small little company. And then I went to go work for, for Exxon Mobil as a data scientist. And the small little company was like, Hey, like we're really excited you're going to Exxon stuff. Go have fun, but could you do a little side projects for us? And so at the time I was freelancing with this little company. Um, and that kind of helped me build up my freelancing clientele so that I wasn't really, when I quit in January, I, I felt like I could, I could pull some clients, um, you know, for my freelancing work. And I'd also built up an audience on LinkedIn of about 10,000 people, um, 10,000 followers. So I was like, ah, oh, the worst that can happen is I can find another job eventually. So that was in, I quit my job January. Uh, let's see, like fourth of 2021 had to get those, uh, vacation days for 2021 paid out. Um, so I had to say it's like January 4th. Uh, so I quit in January 4th of 2021. Yes, that's right. Um, and I probably did freelancing for about three months. And then, um, one of my connections on LinkedIn, she had uh, like a little data academy that she was running. Um, and she didn't really want to make any of the courses. She just kind of wanted to be the brand and the marketing behind it. And we had, I had done some free, um, like speaking, uh, engagements for her in the past. And so she was like, Hey, I'm building this course. Um, she might have even posted it. I want to build these courses. Who would be interested in building them? And I probably just commented and said, I'd be interested in building them. Um, and I can't remember exactly how much it was. It took me a long time to shoot the courses and I did not get paid that much. Uh, but the cool thing was, is I was getting paid to learn how to do it on my own the next time I did it. So it was totally worth it in the end. So that was probably March of 2021. Um, and then around May, I decided, Hey, I want to do this on my own. I want to do my own, you know, courses. And so I spent the next three months or so, um, working 20 hours a week on my course, 20 hours a week freelancing. So I was paying the bills with the freelancing and I was building the course, um, kind of just with the hope it would eventually sell. And I launched later in 2021 in August. So, uh, it took me about three, three months to build everything. And when I say build everything, I don't really actually mean build everything to get to the point where I felt like it was time to launch. Uh, it took about three months. Yeah. Well, you also mentioned uh, building a little bit of an audience. Uh, it sounds like on LinkedIn. Um, can, you, can you share a little bit more about that that process, how you got that started? Um, what did that audience look like? And did they ultimately end up being like your, the customer base that you ultimately bought your course? Yeah, it's the building an audience is never a bad idea in my opinion. And I started, I kind of started my, my content creation on accident a little bit. Um, it, it first started with like, I would just announce things like, Oh, I got a new job at Exxon Mobil and everyone on LinkedIn would kind of go say, congrats, Avery. And like, I don't know, kind of weird stuff. Um, and then I would post maybe once a month on there. I was posting how, how my master's degree was going, like giving a review of the semester, um, uh, maybe talking about some, some important things going on. This is probably in 2019 ish. Um, and then 2020 and, you know, March, something crazy happened where the whole world shut down. And at the time we didn't really know what COVID was. And I mean, COVID obviously is still scary, but at the time it was very scary because we didn't know anything. Um, 
And the government actually had asked like the data scientists of America to try to help them to use data to try to understand COVID a little bit better. I thought that was the coolest thing. I was like, yes, I was born for this moment. Like, here we go. Um, and so I actually made a post on LinkedIn kind of expressing like, Hey, all these data scientists of LinkedIn, um, like, here we go. Like we have a chance to like help beat COVID. Um, and I tagged a bunch of, you know, uh, bigger, you know, you know, like, uh, brand people on LinkedIn, just like random influencers on LinkedIn. I tagged them on the post and that post ended up getting 70,000 impressions. And I was like, Whoa, this is crazy that I can just say something and 70,000 people. That's like, I'm from Utah. So that's like filling up the jazz stadium three times. And I was like, that's incredible. <laughs> that's crazy. Um, and so I started posting more and even I remember I would take a picture and it would get 3000 impressions. And I was like, that is crazy that 3000 people can see this. And I, I kind of got really interested in, in creating content and just kind of failed my way forward into, into building an audience. Um, and you know, that audience was partially my, like the audience I actually wanted for the course, partially not, but it all worked out. And most of my traffic still to this day comes from my LinkedIn audience. Wow. Was, was there any like dips or highs along that journey of, of building that audience on LinkedIn? Did you find that like some posts got a ton of engagement and others hit the, you know, kind of hit the floor or how did that, how did that grow? I mean, that's part of the reason why social media is so addicting, right? It is literally, uh, it's like, baked in for our human uh tendencies to just love the the lottery the you know the gambling of like the slot machine i guess is what it's called that you get a reward every once in a while so yeah there's definitely uh highs um where you know i've had posts uh probably get you know million views which is crazy that's like that's like a third of my state you know utah's not a big state so that's crazy that that many people can see that and there's other times where you know i'll I'll post a bunch of stuff that i think is really good it doesn't get any views um, or maybe even worse is when you post something and people, you know, hate on it or people will kind of trash you in the comments. And that's, that's probably been the biggest lows for me in my content journey is just learning how to deal with haters and with criticism. Um, I'm kind of a defensive person and I don't think anyone really likes having any sort of haters. Um, so that's, that's been a big learning curve for me. Yeah. I'd love to, I'd love to just understand a little bit more about that because I think for a lot of people, they ultimately just don't try because of the fact that they're worried about, you know, the, the inevitable hater that shows up on the internet. How have you, how did you overcome that initial fear and how have you navigated, I guess, just the ups and downs of, of the commentary that comes as a result of you being more visible? I think one, like the first time it happens, I had a, a TikTok go, I mean, not that viral, but, but pretty viral. Like we're talking hundreds of thousands of views. Um, and, and TikTok can be pretty, uh, brutal sometimes. So I remember the first time that happened, I was like, Oh, that really hurt. And I, I shared it with some of my, you know, content creation friends. And, and one of them was basically said, you know what? It really stinks when that happens, but I promise you that this journey that you're going on will be worth every hate comment you ever get. Like the, the, the good parts about being a content creator. Um, and just being a, an entrepreneur, you know, a, like a personal brand entrepreneur, a solopreneur, it's all worth whatever hate you get along the way. Um, so I think having a good, you know, a good network of people to like buoy you up as you go was really important for me. Um, and then the other thing is just like, there's not been one person in life who's done anything meaningful without having a hater. So I almost look at the haters as like a badge of honors. I'm like, yes, I'm finally good enough that someone hates what I do. And looking at it like <laughs> that really helps me like be happy about it, I guess. I love that. That's, that's, that's great. Yeah. It's kind of, it's validating, uh, you know, because if you're not doing anything, nobody's there to hate on it. Um, that, that's, yeah, that's a great perspective. Um, I think if, if I recall correctly, as I was looking into your story, I, I know that you had, um, somewhat of an incident there on LinkedIn. Yeah. Uh, anything you can share with us about that, that, that situation? Yeah, for sure. Um, so basically what Jared's talking about is I have been banned from LinkedIn before and I'm, I'm up to almost 70,000. Hopefully by the time you guys listen to this, I'm at 70,000 followers on LinkedIn. Um, so I've built up my, my LinkedIn audience the last, you know, two and a half years or so. Um, and it's like I said, 90% of my traffic is coming from, from LinkedIn. And keep in mind, that's both for my course business, which is what I spend 90% of my time doing now, but also for my consulting, my contracting, my freelance. Like I was really banking on my LinkedIn. Um, and. And basically, the last you know two months or so, I've had my LinkedIn ca- account restricted uh, probably four or five times. Uh, every time it gets a little bit longer. So, like the first time they they were they basically said, "Oh, okay, you're restricted for two hours." The next time it was four hours. The next time it was eight hours. The next time it was six. Anyways, so I'm at 48 hours right now. I went a whole you know weekend basically with without LinkedIn, and and that's basically my whole traffic source is not coming to my website. 
Uh, and the reason, I don't know. They basically will not tell me. Uh, it's just, you're restricted. I'm not very political. Um, I try to be really nice on the internet. I'm not trying to be hateful or say mean things. I'm not posting, you know, inappropriate content or controversial subjects. You know, I'm not talking about politics. I'm not talking about anything like that. I'm just talking about data science and how to land a job. Um, and so that was, that was really scary for me. It made me realize, you know, you can't have all your eggs in one basket when it comes to traffic. And really our audiences that we grow on social media are great. Um, but they're not owned by us, right? If it, if, if, if you're not paying for something, you're the product. And in this case, we're the product for LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok, all those people. Um, so it really helped me realize, okay, I need to grow my email list. I need to make sure I'm developing relationships. How do I take these people from social media, put them somewhere else where I don't have, I, I'm not going to get restricted arbitrarily by some, you know, tech giant. Let's uh, just zone in. Uh, I kind of jumping all over the place a little bit here, but as I was thinking about your LinkedIn audience, uh, tell us a little bit about the, first of all, how big your audience was when you did your first course launch. I, I did. So like I said, it probably, I quit my job in January of 2021. I did my first little workshop. It was, and looking back on this, this was not the, the best way to do some sort of an info product or a course, but that's a good lesson to learn that like when you do your first course or your first info product, it is going to suck and just embrace it. Like it's going to be terrible. You're going to do everything wrong. And that's what I did. So I probably did one in February. It was a week long intensive where we met from like, 6 to 8 p.m. every night. So for two hours for five days in a row, uh, which is not a good way to do it, guys. Don't do that probably. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I, that was probably my first time doing it. And I probably had between 10 and 15,000 social media followers, um, at the time, which seems ludicrous to like believe that it would all work out the way it did, but it did. And, and what, uh, would, what would you say like the percentage of people were that actually came from that following ultimately ended up in your course? How did you, how did you bring it to market? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So when I first ran my first workshop, it was like a hundred dollars probably for this five, five day workshop. And we probably had 20 to 40 people inside of there. Um, and I, I think I delivered a really, a really great workshop for, especially for the price. Um, but. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of continually trying to figure out, okay, well, I, I did this. That didn't really work. It really worked. This worked a lot better. It's really been, I've really just, my business grows every time I fail. Um, and so it's just a matter of trying to figure out wh what I, where I'm going to fail next. Um, and a really a, an iterative process. Uh, I just went through, um, the, it was, it kind of sucked doing it, but it was totally worth it where I had built a, I launched a course in August of 2021 and I didn't finish the course when I had launched it. And I still hadn't even finished the course, you know, almost a, basically a year later. And it got to the point where I realized I did not design this course in a very, a very good way. And so I had to relaunch my course. I just start from scratch. Um, you know, that was a lot of time wasted on recording and editing videos, but it wasn't wasted because I, I got to learn a lot throughout the process. Um, so for me, every time I fail and moves my business forward, it's just kind of a, it's kind of a janky fall forward. Um, but it works for me. <laughs> I think that that's, that's actually probably more common than any of us would like to admit. There's undoubtedly as much as I think many people like to share the successes on the surface. Chances are is there's probably a lot of failure that ultimately led to that success. And I think if anything, you're probably just more honest about those failures that <laughs> <laughs> helped you, helped you make it to those successful moments. Um, well, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about, I, I also hear a rumor that you have a podcast as well. Um, how is that or, or has that contributed to kind of just the overall growth of your community that you've been building? It, it's so interesting because, um, podcasting is very interesting and it's something I'm still learning. Like I said, I'm, I'm, my, my approach is I will try anything and see how it goes. And I'll, I'll base my decisions off of that once I've actually tried it. And I think that's a big thing as an entrepreneur. We have to be, you know, capable of taking the first step into the dark and, and being able to say, you know what? This might not work, but I'm going to learn from it. It'll either work or I'm going to learn. Um, and so I, I did, I ran a podcast even before I had a course, um, which is kind of interesting. Uh, in social media, we can be really focused on likes. We can really be focused on comments. You know, the statistics are for our followers on podcasts. There's one metric and one metric alone. And keep in mind, I'm a data guy, right? So I'm, I'm even more interested in the numbers. Uh, on podcasts, it's really just like 
how many people listen to your podcast? You know, that's the only number. It's really hard to get feedback from podcasts. Um, so I actually, this is, this is interesting. I haven't done a podcast in about 10 months. It's been about maybe a little bit less, maybe about eight months. Um, and the reason is, is because I needed to focus on another strategy. It just like, I, I was putting in time. I didn't know how the podcast was being received is the numbers were okay, but I, it's just really hard to get feedback. So I focused on. Only on LinkedIn content. I was like, I need to focus really hard on LinkedIn content. And I was able to grow even just this year. I grew my audience on LinkedIn from probably 20,000 to 70,000. So that's, you know, tripling a little bit more than tripling my growth. And then once I got my LinkedIn groove going, I actually went to YouTube for a month and I grew my YouTube audience from a thousand to 7,000. So I got a little bit of a YouTube right now. Uh, and YouTube's kind of flowing a little bit more and I've learned a lot about YouTube. And so next year I'm going to revisit the podcast. But one of the coolest things I've learned, my podcast numbers haven't gone down at all, even though I've never released a new episode in the last eight months. And that's one great part about podcasts. If they are evergreen, you know, people can go back and listen at any time. Um, and I think what the podcasts do, it's just hard for me to know because I can't see the numbers exactly, but you know, I might get a million impressions on a LinkedIn post, but I'm out of their mind the next moment. LinkedIn. You get to listen to my lovely voice, or sorry, a podcast. You get to listen to my lovely voice for, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes. And the relationship that you can grow with someone on a podcast is very immense. And it's, it's unlike really anything else that exists. So I'm, I'm ready to double down again on, on, on the podcast. And actually a lot of my, my newer students in the course have been telling me that they, you know, they found me via podcast and I'm like, I haven't made a new episode in months, but it works. It's still bringing in people. It, it was well worth the investment for sure. <laughs> Very cool. Well, let's uh, talk a little bit, just going back to the situation to where you, you end up banned on LinkedIn. Can you tell us, we always go through the challenges, but like, I can't imagine a bigger challenge than that as you're trying to grow and build your audience. How did you navigate that? How did you pivot? And how did you ultimately... Did you, I mean, what, what was the actual successful strategy? Was it moving your audience elsewhere or did you ultimately end up back? Where did you land? I think it was a, it, it was an alarm bell for me. Um, and it still is to this day, uh, because I, I need, I know even now I need to focus more on building an email list. I need to focus more on diversifying my content streams. You know, um, I, I have, I have like 6,000 on TikTok. I have like 7,000 on, on YouTube. But can I grow that to something like 20 or 30,000? I think focusing on that would be really important. But really just growing my email list because my email list is pretty small. I don't mind sharing numbers. So, uh, my email list is like 7,000 people, uh, which is, which is pretty small for, I mean, it's, it's big in some stages, but you know, I've been working on this for a year and a half. It's not necessarily the biggest email list. I'm not, you know, at 10,000, for example. Um, so I know I need to focus on it more. My actual strategy was just like, uh, I pay for LinkedIn premium now. So LinkedIn premium is basically as a, as a creator or as, as someone who uses LinkedIn often, you can pay the low price of $99 a month to get LinkedIn premium, which comes with a lot of props. But basically I'm paying LinkedIn a don't restrict me fee, in my <laughs> opinion, for $99 a month. But for me, it's totally worth it. And I haven't had any issues since I started paying it. So that's my, my cop out right now, but I know I need to focus on building an email list getting my other socials to the area that my LinkedIn is on. That Those are on my to-do list. Did you have any type of uh, pivots that you made uh, after that? Or I, did that yeah. did that change how you... It, it should. I need to focus more on emails. And I, I recognize it. Unfortunately, it happened at a really bad time where I was launching uh, my brand new program, which I was really excited about. Uh, so it was kind of a hard time to pivot my marketing strategies and also kind of roll out this, this new program I was running on. So I've really focused on the rollout of my new program, uh, which was great because it was my, this, this last, uh, November was the best month I've ever had all in due to pushing people to this new program, which is, which has been awesome. We're getting awesome results too. Um, so that's kind of what I was focusing on, but I know I need to come back and, and figure out how do I pivot, you know, my LinkedIn audience? How do I capture more of their emails? Because that, at the end of the day, that's the one thing you, you can control is what people do on your website and how you reach out to them via email. Um, those are the two things, you know, I want to focus more on. Got it. Well, let's talk about, uh, how you ultimately ended up landing, uh, on Kajabi. Uh, did, was that the first thing that came to mind when you started to create a course or, or what led you on the journey to that you ultimately found the platform? Yeah. It, I did not start my, my content or my, my course creation in, in Kajabi. 
Um, when I first got started, you know, that workshop I did, I was a new entrepreneur. I had just quit my job and I was, you know, scared out of my mind. So I did not want to pay for anything. So my first course I ever did, I used Google Meet, basically Zoom, right? It was all live. So we just did live calls. I used PowerPoint and then I used Google Drive <laughs> and I would send them, I used Gmail and I would just send them, you know, if they couldn't make it, here's the recording. Here's the, here's the slides. So that was my first experience. And then, you know, I, I made about $2,000 from that. And I was like, okay, that's pretty cool. $2,000 in a week. That's like, that's like six figures a year. I just got to figure out how to do that. Right. Like, um, so I was, okay, I can do a little bit more. So I actually started in, uh, a competitor and I launched a free course in the competitor and there's, there's good parts and there's, there's bad parts of the competitor. Um, but then. Um, I had also done a, a course for someone else in Teachable, right? That's yeah, I built a, a course for someone else in Teachable, and they're like, "You gotta get Teachable, you gotta try it." So I tried Teachable, and Teachable has some pros, has some cons. Um, but one of the biggest reasons I switched to Kajabi was, and, and keep in mind, I am a techie. I can, I can program. I program a lot. I love technology. I love computers. I love software. But the idea of having all of your stuff in one place is awesome. And so that's why I'm with Kajabi. That's why I stay with Kajabi. It's simple. It's just like everything I need is all pretty much in one place. Um, of course, I can add some other things to it. And, and you know, Kajabi has the flexibility that allows me to add other stuff to it. But just having my email, my website, my courses all in one place is, is awesome. Um, and then I've, you know, I've had ups with Kajabi where I'm like, ah, Kajabi is awesome. It's the best thing on planet earth. And I've had downs where I'm like, Kajabi stinks. It's not working for me. Um, and what I really learned is it's not really the software that makes that big of a difference. The software can help, but it's really about your principles as, you know, an instructor and also your principles as a marketer that, that really count towards the end. Um, so that's what I try to focus on more is what I can control. I can't always control the, the features in Kajabi or anything like that, but I know if I work on my marketing skills, and my instructor skills, that good things happen. <laughs> I love that summary. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, I guess, just where you've taken this and how far you've came. Uh, you, you quit your job several years ago. You're still doing this. Um, can you? Are, are you willing to share a little bit of like the the numbers and like what, like, or even just like success and what that what that ultimately is for you? Yeah, for sure. I think the the biz the biggest success is what I could describe. Like today, basically. Today, I woke up. I live in Utah. We had a giant snowstorm basically overnight. And I was like, Oh my gosh, it's going to be powder on the mountains. I have to go skiing. So I can move everything off my schedule that needs to be moved. Go skiing this morning for like three, four hours, you know, eat, eat lunch at the lodge, enjoy the watching the snowfall and then come back home and without missing a beat. I didn't have to take a PTO day. Um, I know I'm still going to, you know, make money quote unquote today. Like it's not a big deal. I'm not stressed about it at all. To me, that is like the freedom that I'm really looking for, uh, in my life. Uh, but yeah, Kajabi's, Kajabi's totally changed my life and allowed me to make, you know, a lot more money than I thought I would ever make. Uh, basically I've, I quit my job in 2021, uh, at Exxon, right? And, you know, or what are we at? Basically when this comes out, probably like two years later, uh, I was able to double my salary, which is incredible. I was making six figures at Exxon, able to double my salary, more than double my salary, uh, which is, you know, absolutely incredible. I've had launches, you know, where in a week we're talking not, not hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, but you know, not, not thousands of dollars, somewhere in between, uh, which is like absolutely incredible for, for me and my family. Uh, but, but also like more importantly is, is it's this lifestyle to help me create for myself, but, but also the people who I'm, getting to teach and influence in their lives, right? Um, I, one of my biggest, um, little niches for my audience is teachers that, you know, are burnt out of being teaching, of being teachers. And I've helped teachers go from making $40,000 to $80,000 in like three or four months. Um, and all of a sudden they're not working 50 hours a week, you know, stuck at a school. They're working like 37 hours a week in, at home because they can work a remote job. And those type of stories really is what keeps me doing it is like, Oh my gosh, these people have an opportunity to live a better life and I can help them do that. And that is, that's so meaningful to me. I, it really means a lot. I, I need to get my wife in that course because she was a teacher and she's talked about like do, doing like training on uh, data science. So it sounds like this is like the perfect fit. 
It is. It, we, well, I love teachers. Teachers are, teachers make for great data analysts. That's one of like the, the advice I try to give to people who are trying to make a course is the more the riches are in the niches, right? And so like, for example, I'll do webinars where I'm, I'm only talking to teachers. If you're not a teacher, I don't want you at this webinar. And you think that would lower your sales opportunity, right? Cause oh, I can't speak to as many people. We actually make way more money when you're only talking to one person. So, you know, I could probably. Honestly, I might even do this next year. So look out, like I might just run my course as teacher to data analyst. Like th- th- I've honestly thought about doing that. So I-, I think it's, it's great to niche down and it can be really, really good. Yeah. Well, one other thing I wanted to kind of go over with you is, uh, the shift. Uh, I know just for you in particular, actually moving from a traditional day job to going independent. Um, one of the best, you know, best parts of the traditional day job is you have that sustainable, just ongoing, the check shows up every, <laughs> every week or every other week. Uh, what have you done to just create, kind of create some sustainability in your, your entrepreneurial business to ensure that you, you have some sense of normality and can live, uh, I guess, a, a regular life, if you will, um, as an entrepreneur. Yeah, it is. It is the, the bi-weekly checks are something I do definitely miss sometimes. Although, yeah, you you can make it so you get a bi-weekly check from PayPal and Stripe, kind of, right? Like, you can kind of replace it. It's just not as guaranteed necessarily. And some weeks it's really high and some weeks it's really low. Um, so it is kind of a interesting uh, experience. And to be honest, it's been a really big struggle for me because, um, it's, it's scary not knowing where your next paycheck is going to come from. Um, and it's something I've had to learn to do. So one of the best things. Uh, advice I think I could give is giving yourself, you know, a six month emergency fund that just takes so much stress. Cause it's like, if nothing, if I don't make any sales for the next six months, I'm good. Right. So having that six month cushion, which it can take a while to build up. Right. Uh, I think is good. The other thing is, uh, that is really cool is payment plans. So, you know, my course costs more than a thousand dollars. Not everyone has a thousand dollars they can spend in, you know, at a moment's notice. And so they can enter my program with a payment plan. And I usually do six month payment plans. So for a lot of those payment plans, that means, you know, multiple times during the, the year or the month, I guess, right? Or I guess, yeah, I, over the six months, I basically get a check for $250, $250, $250, $250, which is awesome. Cause at that point, it is a little bit more steady. Um, so that, that's something that I think does well is, is one, you know, having, having a good savings is good. Two, the payment plans really help. And then three, um, this is, this is a quote I've heard recently. Um, but it's, it's the person who makes the most offers wins. Um, and I don't really know if that's necessarily true or not. Uh, but that's something that I've learned that if I don't spend my time inviting people to change their lives, you know, Hey, like guys, I have a lot of experience. I can really help you. Here's this opportunity. Take it or not. It's okay. But like, here's the opportunity giving people the chance to, to change their lives and, you know, have me be part of it is something I have to be doing every month. Otherwise, I will run into issues. You know, uh, if if you do not market yourself, if you do not sell yourself, you do not make sales. And it, you could have the best curriculum in the entire world. You have to have at least some aspect of your business that involves selling and involves marketing. Um, and the more often I do that, the more money I make and the more lives I change. So it's kind of a win win win, in my opinion. Yeah, the scary thing is kind of the is also the empowering thing. You don't know where that check's coming from, but yet you do because it's ultimately you <laughs> that's responsible for bringing in that next check. Yeah, I I love I I love and hate the pressure all at the same time. <laughs> it's it's the best thing on earth and it's the worst thing too. Yeah. Well, uh, tell us what do you think uh, just in this overall space, you know, in the crater economy as it's called. What do you think is coming next? We're getting close to the end of the year. I don't know exactly when this this episode will air, but well, it's going to be somewhere close around either right towards the end of the year or maybe at the new year. What do you think is coming uh, in 2023? Uh, it's a good question. Um, to be honest, I I really don't know. That's that's like my honest answer. My my approximate answer that I'll try to give is I do think you know more more people are going to try to do info products, which I think is awesome. I think the fact that we can take info products. And just the idea of educating people and give that back to individuals than large institutions is incredible. Um, don't get me, I have a master's degree. So like I spent a lot of time and a lot of money on college. Um, but I do think that you can, and I love college in a lot of ways, but I think you can learn a lot <laughs> without going to college. And I think that's very empowering. So I'd love to see, and I predict that more people will get into the info product space. 
Um, I think you'll see big rises in um, TikTok. I think TikTok's only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think YouTube. I think YouTube is still massively underrated. I love YouTube. The, the crazy thing about YouTube is someone will pay you a, a decent chunk of money to grow your audience. Like that is an, for to sell your course. Like that is an incredible way to look at it. It's very difficult. I'm, I have a love hate relationship with it, but, uh, I think YouTube and TikTok still massively underrated, um, and great places to, to grow an audience. I'm really interested to see what happens to Twitter. I know that's a little controversial right now with the Elon <laughs> Musk uh, acquisition or not. Um, sure. right now I'm just sitting and kind of waiting because I do think there, there is a chance that, you know, Twitter will either <laughs> go super far downhill or super far uphill. I don't know which one yet. Uh, but I am sitting waiting, kind of watching. What they're doing and, and how that might impact, you know, the creator economy and, and, you know, online courses and info products. I don't have a prediction, I guess, but I'm just watching it closely to see if there's opportunities or I should focus somewhere else. <laughs> well, let's just talk about what's something a little bit more within your control. Uh, just for you specifically, what do you have planned for 2023? Any new courses, new, new programs, anything you're going to be offering? My big focus is continuing to, uh, do fulfillment on. My 10 week boot camp that I released in November. Um, right now I'm, I'm doing like, I'm going very slowly with this initial cohort of students. Uh, we have like initial cohort of like 70 students or something like that. I'm really making sure that's a really good experience for them because this is the first students that are in this particular boot camp and, and course. And I want to make sure that it's really good and I can be really proud of it and really confident in it. Um, because comp, if you believe that your product can change lives, that makes your marketing so much easier. Cause why wouldn't you want to change lives? Right. So I'm, I'm trying to make sure I have the best products that, I, you know, in this space. So that will end in mid January. And then I'm going to shift a lot more to try to, to focus on marketing. So some things I'm excited about in 2023 is I'd love to grow this business to a uh, half a million dollars. I'm not quite there yet. That would be awesome. Um, in, in, in the year. Um, that would be awesome. So that's, that's a goal for me. Um, I'd love to see, you know, my social media grow. Love to see my audience, my email list grow a lot. Um, and I would love to try to play around with different marketing techniques, try to do a weekly webinar, try to do a couple, maybe a monthly challenge or something like that. Um, but the big thing is for me is, you know, how, can I get to, uh, 150, you know, lives changed people like transferring their jobs? That would be a huge mark for me. Amazing. Well, for anyone listening, uh, maybe they're not quite ready to take that entrepreneurial leap themselves, but they're thinking about, hey, maybe I could get a job as a data scientist. Uh, what's the best place for them to get to know you a little bit better? Uh, maybe find out some information about your offerings? Yeah, for sure. Um, my, my, my best website is datacareerjumpstart.com, just my, my business name. Um, and then I'm also really active on LinkedIn. So people can find me if you just search Avery Smith. Uh, hopefully I'll be one of the first ones to pop up. I love it. We'll, of course, have that for you in the show notes. Um, as always, I uh, would love to ask for you to leave us a comment on your review of the podcast. We love uh, interacting and hearing from you. As Avery mentioned earlier, um, you know, it's really hard to understand and like hear from and connect with our audience. So we love it when you leave those comments. Of course, you can also, you know, connect with us on LinkedIn as well. Uh, let us know with through a DM or uh, a message on a social profile. We'd love to hear from you. Love to have your reviews. And also, I know you you mentioned you're not releasing new episodes yet, but go and listen. What's, what's the name of your podcast, Avery? It's called Data Career Podcast as of right now. The name okay. might change. I don't know. But Data Career Podcast will probably bring it up. Well, check that out, too. Uh, leave a review for Avery as well. I know he's feeling Appreciate it, too. It. <laughs> we want to hear from you. Um, but with that said, uh, I believe that's all we have for you this week uh, on the podcast. Uh, we will look forward to seeing you next week on the Kajabi Edge podcast.